I'll learn to count one of these days. Hello, hello. Hello. All right, I think we're starting here. All right, let us know if you guys can hear us. This is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop here with Mr. Brian Vibberts of Vibberts Mixing, seven-time Grammy winner. He has worked with the likes of, in case you're not familiar, if you missed my intro from his main presentation, he's worked with the likes of Billie Eilish and Mariah Carey and Michael Jackson and Billy Joel and Green Day and Metallica and Jay-Z and my, I'm going to run out of breath here. It's just uh, <laughs> decades worth of some of the biggest artists and some of the biggest records in history uh, as an assistant, as an engineer, as a mixer. Have you ever worked as a producer or has it mostly been engineering? Yes. No, a uh, producer as well. Yeah. Here we go. So some of the biggest artists and pretty much all of the roles you could imagine from uh, assistant up through producer, mixer, engineer. Did you ever work as a runner early on? Yes, I did. In the all early right. days. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> so every single role imaginable. And we're going to be answering your questions. He just did an awesome MixCon masterclass about two hours long. I think it's been the longest MixCon masterclass we've done tremendous detail he showed us almost every single knob dial and button in the entire session a great track from a singer named carrie flaherty beautiful one a great pick for this session big thanks to carrie for letting us use that track also yes. big thanks to our sponsors as you guys know uh, the all these mixcon videos are free on sonic scoop thanks to our sponsors and the sponsor for this one was antelope audio it is a perfect fit because i think i witnessed at least a half a dozen pieces of antelope yes. audio rack gear in your studio you had yeah. the uh, the Goliath HD, the Galaxy 64, the 10MX for the clocking. You had like two or three Orions in the other rack, and I wouldn't be That's surprised right. you had some as coasters around in the studio. <laughs> any of it. Um, so check those guys out at, over at antelopeaudio.com. And also, uh, I'm, I should say, I'm talking into a microphone right now. This is an Axino microphone. It is a mic modeling mic uh, from Antelope Audio. Um, they make there's really two brands out there for standalone modeling mics and antelope is one of them and they have been priced more in like the 13 to 1500 dollars price range and this is the first one that's like 400 dollars. and the mm -hmm. models are good i want to tell a quick story before we ask questions of you brian a quick story about brian yeah, absolutely. Ears. this is how good brian's ears are i uh selected my favorite mic model i went through a bunch and he was like Oh, there's that Neumann M series sound. He's like maybe an M149, and I'm like, you devil! This is the uh, Neumann M series model they have. It was the M103, which <laughs> is a very close cousin. It looks almost identical to the M149, and uh, that means that the model's good and that Brian's ears are amazing. That he could pick that out. That's good. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> They're still working. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys had so many questions that came in during the live Q&A. We just have Brian for about a half an hour here, so I want to get right into the questions. Um, and let's we'll first do the ones that came in uh, during sorry, the live MixCon masterclass, I should say. And uh, after that, we'll follow it up with questions that have been coming in uh, since then um, in the uh, this new live Q&A uh, link. So starting off with Will Newton, who asks, you mentioned starting in 2004 at what point did mixing start being a full-time pursuit for you did your client base grow organically or did you take specific steps to make this a profession and yeah. i imagine you started mixing in 2004 you've been involved in audio for longer than that i'd figure yeah because i went to uh berkeley college of music and graduated in 91 so right after that uh, that was in boston of course i was in new york city so i i it was uh, you know that was my only job since 1991 uh, in 2004 is when I went freelance, so that's kind of what that that year is. And um, but in terms of how it all grew, uh, yeah, basically organically. I mean, I, I always wanted to record and mix as you know, being full time, and that's what I've done. Uh, I've I've never had any other job since graduating college. So, uh, but it's you know, it's connections that I met in studios, some of the bigger studios that I worked in. It's just kind of connecting that way. And also, you know, going to uh, functions from Naris, the Recording Academy and, and things like that, just being active with other people and, and networking events. Yeah. Now, uh, 
graduating from Berkeley for music and music production, did you find that back then in the early 90s that a majority of the people you graduated with are still in the music business or have many of them dropped off, moved on, or never really got started as professionals? What was your experience like back then in the, the early 90s with the graduating yeah, class? Yeah, uh, generally, I, I don't really know the numbers. I would say most from Berkeley are probably still in it, but there have been a lot that have that have dropped out. The the music business, as everyone knows, is a roller coaster. So it's sure. uh, there's been some tough years for me as well. So, uh, but uh, now things are going well. Last year was was not so good. Everything kind of halted mm -hmm. <laughs> for most of us. Now all around the but, world, that is not yeah, exactly. to you. But uh, you know what? What I learned uh, at Berkeley still, you know, has helped me throughout my entire career. So, even the stuff that wasn't directly engineering. And producing like in other words uh conducting class you know when i started mm. recording orchestras then i knew had that knowledge of oh yeah i know what the conductor's doing i can watch the conductor i i know how to conduct so i, I know how to read the score so things like that became yeah. uh you know helpful later great all right uh andre Earl Meyer, uh, 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 Andre, let me know if I'm saying your name correctly. He's uh, been here for other uh, MixCon master classes. I've seen you commenting. And uh, tell me if you got the name right. Andre Earl Meyer, I believe. How loud does Brian have his monitor speakers when he is working on the mix? Great question, Andre. Uh, it is around 75 dB. Um, that is, I, I mean, I don't do that religiously. That's just I, I uh, you know, check the level every once in a while, and that's what it is. The room is not a, a huge mixing room, so because of that uh, 75 dB SPL, it still actually sounds loud. So that would be my average listening level. If I want to bring it down really low and listen on the orotones or listen, you know, low to see if I still hear the bass and to see if the, the vocal is still coming through, I usually go down around maybe 55. So it, it, that's quite low uh 55 60 uh but if, if every once in a while i'll listen you know much louder 85 or 90 but that might be one time through just to make sure that it still sounds you know great loud so but generally it's 75 good question Great. Yeah. And I, I, it makes a lot of sense to me. It's uh, loud enough that you can get a good feel for low end, but not so loud that you're going to totally wear yourself out. Yeah. Um, and then do you have like a second level kind of programmed in a dim switch that brings it down to that closer to 60 dB range? Or you just kind of use the dial and do it to taste? I, I do have a dim switch, uh, which I use sometimes, but I'm usually doing it with the dial. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. All right, onwards in the future. Connor Collister asks, I'd love if you could share your Instagram chat into the uh, Instagram account to the chat. I believe that I did uh, put that in there, but it's Vibberts Mixing is his tag there. So look up Vibberts Mixing on uh, Instagram. You'll find him really fast. That's two Bs in Vibberts. And one thing um, that I want to mention on that quickly, uh, Justin, is unlike some other uh, people that have an Instagram account that may not check comments or may have someone else running the account, I run it myself and I answer questions. It's it's more of a conversation of people. And if anyone that goes has been on there already knows this and anyone that, that is new to it can just go and, and scroll through pictures and, and see that, yes, it is a conversation where we all kind of, you know, bring something to the table. So I really encourage everyone to, to yeah follow me on Instagram and, and be a part of the conversation. Great. Now, uh, I unfortunately did not mark down the name of the person who asked this next question. I'm not sure if it was Connor or someone else, but the question is, do you use outboard uh, Do you use outboard for compression mostly? Being in the box, I find especially bus comps seem more thin and not so 3D sounding as outboard comps. I believe I saw a good number of software compressors in there, but um, to feel free to knock that one. Yeah, so most of, most of the compression is in Pro Tools. I, I do have a few outboard uh, compressors and limiters that I use sometimes, uh, but not a lot. But if if you noticed on the on the mix bus, there's no compression. Right. So on that, there's you know all the compression is happening actually within all the the individual tracks and not on the bus. Yeah. So there's no compression there. There is a little bit of limiting only for mix approval, really, mm -hmm. for the artist and and uh, if the producer or record label, but that gets removed when it goes to mastering. So it so, seems like generally the outboard in, in Pro Tools. 
Yeah. Right. So it seems like the outboard you're using regularly would be your summing system. You're going through a, a summing system, which is super easy to recall. And then occasionally yes. printing special effects like that uh, guitar pedal we saw and those kinds of things. That's so right. More often just little instances where you're printing back in rather than using this hardware inserts. Um, right. Yeah. Hardware, analog hardware does not recall as well as say an antelope uh, effect session that you can just, you know, pull right <laughs> up. Right. Um, and I would say to those people who are complaining about um, the bus comps and comps not sounding as good in the digital environment, you got to get the better digital compressors because there's some yes. amazing ones out there. Yeah, and I agree. Using some plug in alliance. There's some amazing ones. Some of the waves stuff people like a lot. Those antelope audio effects, which you used a bunch. Um, those are uh, there, there's some really good ones out there. And it is one of those places, I think, to look for some of the, the premium flavors for people who are known for um, emulating analog well. Any handful of favorite uh, and analog emulated compressors that you use a lot? Compressors, wow, I mean, there's, there's so many. I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I have so many. But on, I mean, on the mix bus, I use the, uh, the Sony Oxford uh, limiter, which you probably saw, uh, but I, I am not doing that usually on, on individual tracks. I mean, I just use everything but like what you said you have to find the the great emulations uh, of of you know certain companies there's mm -hmm. there's that definitely you know good and not so good out there with the plugin so sure um all right uh next one here is a question from antonio claudio Pallone, who says we know that the big dogs like you start analog and then go to digital now that you have uh, I'm, I'm having a little trouble with, uh, with uh, reading this one. Let me try again. Now that you have get the same type of controls, what do you miss from the analog realm? So I'm not sure of the middle part there, but he's basically asking, what do you miss most from being in the analog days? Okay. Uh, well, from, from working with tape, I kind of miss that low end EQ bump that you get naturally with tape, mm -hmm. but I don't miss the hiss of tape. So, yes. so generally I'm okay with, without, you know, using tape. I went from analog tape to digital tape to now, you know, in the, in the DAW. So uh, I really don't, I don't really miss tape all that much. Uh, I, I do miss the sound of the analog console, but if I'm recording, I am using an analog console. Mm -hmm. So I can't really say I miss it because I'm still using it. Right. Uh, it's and just that I'm not using it for mixing. Yep. And then you're you're summing through some analog stuff there, so uh, that's ideally giving you some of that flavor. And do you that's ever right. use, go through the paradigm of using um, like uh, a single analog channel strip on everything, like it was a console, or do you just love variety too much to go that approach of putting the same console channel strip on every? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that, I have experimented with that a little bit, and it and it does work. Uh, but I find myself, you know, halfway through all the tracks, like, oh, I really wish I, I really want to use something else besides the same one over and over. Yeah. Uh, but I love that concept, though, mm -hmm. especially if, if there's been like 30 or 40 channels that have been uh, modeled so you can right. choose different that. Yeah, that that works really well. I like that mm -hmm. whole concept. Uh, and I have a question of my own for you about uh, busing here. And um, uh, there's a lot of people asking about uh, automation. People were impressed at how much automation you're doing. It's something that I stress a lot for people who are mixing well and are looking to kind of go to the next level that they often leave off that step of going through the song as a whole and doing automation, enhancing the emotion that way. And I know it's a big part of what you do. But uh, there's a question I had there about um, using the VCA, so there was a moment where you showed us on your console, you moving one fader and all the uh, related faders moving with it. And yes. I'm curious why you like that approach of moving all of them rather than saying, busing them all to a group together and then moving that summed group together. Is there any pro or con between okay. moving multiple okay. yeah, sub instruments it's, it's... or instead of the entire group? Yeah, it's kind of uh, the same. Uh, I mean, that, that VCA is controlling a group so right. it is controlling a group of of faders sometimes like in, if you remember in the drums it was like just the kick just the snare but mm -hmm. there is also the two faders that one is not compressed one is compressed the parallel compression mm -hmm. that those are like the whole drum set going right. up and down so uh especially if i have like a lot of rhythm guitars more in a rock track mm -hmm. if they're let's just say there's uh, 16 guitars or 12 guitars, I might have all of the rhythm guitars all on one fader. 
mm-hmm. so I can bring them up up and down in the mix uh, as as needed. And I and I might bring do those like in between vocal phrases, bring that guitar up a little bit, but then when the vocal comes back in, kind of ease that back. So that power of the guitar is always there. And and that can be also be, you know, with, with jazz, if it's jazz piano and a vocalist, the jazz piano can be up a little bit and the vocalist comes back in and that may ease back down a little, but then in between phrases, I might just, you know, massage it and bump it up a little bit. That makes sense. Yeah. And then you noted that you don't really do much processing on the mix bus itself. Do you like to do processing on individual subgroup buses or are you more likely to do that kind of thing on individual tracks and parallel and stuff like that? Uh, mostly on individual tracks. The only one that I can really think of that I do that with, with you know, everything all together would be the background vocals. I'll have them all go, all the background vocals going to uh, a, a stereo aux and I'll put the effects on that aux. So I'm kind of compressing all of the backing vocals together. Mm-hmm. Sounds, uh, makes sense to me. All right. All right. Uh, onwards uh, into the future. Next one. I'm suddenly home. Uh, he's got a kind of a two part question here. His name is K- Kenton is his real name. Hey, Kenton. He says, I have an Orion 2017 in my project studio, but I've been apprehensive about routing out of the DAW through the Antelope interface and then back into the buses of the DAW to use the Antelope effects. Any tips or direction for using outboard routing for these kinds of interfaces, which are all becoming more common? Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. good routing question. I, I, as you saw, what I do is I'm using them, them as well, the AFX I'm using as hardware inserts. Uh, there's, if no matter where you're going in your outboard gear rack, you can use it as a bus. I would just say uh, you want to make sure the latency is is low. If if it's if you're going to a delay or reverb, it really doesn't matter too much with the latency. But if it's a EQ or compression, the latency on the Orion products and, and and a lot of the antelope audio products is is extremely low so i would say you don't have to really worry about it and and go for it and the hardware inserts should also compensate i think for any round trip latency there's ways for them to do that in addition to the delay compensation and all that yeah yes that's correct yeah and then i think uh, the only reason you're doing them as hardware inter- inserts if i understand correctly is you have a pro tools hd system which has its own dsp processing and mm-hmm. the antelope effects aren't compatible just being native inside of that but if you have a i shouldn't have used the word native because if you have a native system meaning non pro tools hd system a standard run off your computer system then the antelope audio effects should work in pro tools and most daws just as inserts with a little kind of plug-in wrapper they have so they show up like yes. a normal plugin that's right so, that's something to check into. So uh, Kenton, uh, double check, like if you are on a native system and you have a relatively recent DAW, you should be able to use those antelope effects right in there instead of doing the hardware inserts like Brian does. If maybe you have an older version that doesn't support that functionality or you're using some type of HD system that doesn't support that functionality, then in that case, you just run them as hardware inserts. And like Brian says, there really should be no latency at all. Um, there is, is there a stage of, I guess, analog to digital conversion and digital to analog conversion, or is it sending digital audio back and forth to the antelope? It's, uh, well, it would be, it would be digital. I mean, it's using the digi port, gotcha. uh, what I'm using, but other, other people may be using either the Thunderbolt or the USB. Right. So port. it should be digital audio being sent back yeah. and forth. So it's not That's even right. an extra stage. So I would say, don't be afraid of it. I don't think there's yeah, any reason to be afraid it. of it, Kenton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ronald Andrade asks, waiting for the Q&A to hear his opinion on automating plugins like the Waves Vocal Rider and Bass Rider. Have you tried any of these automatic automators like the Vocal Rider and Bass Rider? Yes, I have. <laughs> and, Thoughts, feelings? And it, now I'm, I'm okay. Uh, I like a lot of Waves products, but I, I, I don't like those personally. Mm. Uh, first of all, I find that they're not fast enough. Mm. So they're making moves that that are generally okay but then there's more that needs to be done after and Mm -hmm. but another big reason for me is i'm i'm not only making uh, you know fader moves for volume i'm making them for expression yes and and those plugins don't know you know they're not smart enough to do that i thought that was going to be the answer 
um, because it's like they almost do the opposite with automation that you're seeking to do. I mean, there's two mm -hmm. reasons to do automation. One is to make things more even and balanced throughout. And that can be an important reason to automate. Like the hi-hat sounded great in the chorus, but now they're too loud in this sparse verse section, so they need to be brought down. Um, but Wave's vocal writer might not uh, uh, be able to do that kind of thing because it doesn't know that all the instrumentation around it has changed and then it needs to be brought down. Yeah, um, that's right. So it kind of could work like a, like a automatic clip gain so that you're not driving maybe your compressors as hard. But then the other reason you're trying to do things is the exact opposite. You're not trying to level things out, but you're saying, ooh, let's bring this out and enhance this area. Um, Especially so, the end of a phrase or end of a word or mm -hmm. or something where the vocalist may have, you know, went off mic just a little bit in their performance. Mm -hmm. I need to kind of boost that up to make sure we don't lose it. And sure. uh, yeah, it's just better by hand. I, I just love that the, the feel of the faders and doing it manually. There's I can just get more out of the vocal performance and any instrument, you know, I just uh, so I have tried those. But uh, for me. Or how I mix it's I'm I don't use them. Got it. All right. Last couple of questions that came in during the master class here. And then we'll switch to some from the live QA. Luca Mess asks, what do you think of plugins like Soothe or Smooth Operator? Have you tried either of those? Yeah. Uh uh Soothe is, I believe that's uh OEK sound. It's from that manufacturer. That's a really okay. great plugin. Mm -hmm. And I, I should actually use it more because <laughs> I love what it does. So uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of that one. Smooth operator, I, I haven't tried, so I can't really, I can't really say one way or another on that one. Understood. All right, that's all the questions that came in during the live masterclass. Now, oh wait, no, there's one more that came in during the live masterclass. And when this came in, I said, oh, we can't ask this. This is a hip hop mixing question. But then I'm like, oh, Brian's work on hip hop records. Let's ask it. Kevin Climax <laughs> asks question: How do you drive a kick slash 808? mids to the front and leave the low in the subs to have a stronger punch that you can hear well in all systems. Is that a good decision? Is there a better way? So he's basically asking about malting 808s, hip hop kicks, that kind of thing, and how you might go about that. Yeah, uh, that's that, that's good because you want both. You definitely want that punch. And I, I think the punch in the 808s is, is really around 80 hertz to 150, like in that range. And then, of course, your low end is going to be around 40 hertz and mm -hmm. you don't want to get rid of that but if you just kind of do that bell curve around um you know going from 80 up to 140 150 and getting that 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 punch more out of it without bringing up the highs that's it, it definitely works and another thing i would say if you're doing like another layer that has compression on the 808 you um you could also filter out just for that one track if you're just trying to get more punch you could filter out some of the lows and then have a a, a little bit of a, a medium to slower attack so you still get that because the 808 has a natural punch to it but then have the release time be quick so it still has that initial uh attack of the 808 and then releases quickly because you know so it it doesn't still hold it down for the next the next kick. Right. That makes a lot of sense. All right. We're coming up close on a half an hour here. So I'm going to see if we can get through a couple of the questions that came through the uh, live Q&A uh, session. And uh, Curtis, I think we answered your question about SPL monitoring levels. Uh, not sure how to pronounce your handle here. It may be Cuber. Uh, it says, hey, Brian, thank you for sharing your knowledge. My question is, do I need to get an external A to D converter even when I own a decent audio interface? Hmm. Well, if you're staying in the box, then not uh, really, because except for how you're getting to your speakers, you're, right. doing if you're mixing for there. people who've done stuff on there. And the only thing you're worrying about is just the two channels of DAC, basically. Yeah, that's right. So it's not 100% necessary. If you're doing if you're doing anything out of the box, then then yes, th that conversion is is extremely important. That's why I love Antelope Audio because I love mm -hmm. this, the sound of the converters. So, uh, you know, if you're going to any any kind of outboard gear or 500 series rack or or any kind of analog summing, anything like that, you would you would need to have a, a good converter. Right. But if it's just the speakers, then, yeah, it's not as quite as necessary. You just need a good one that's like stereo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the best way I would just piggyback on that is to say that 
like it depends what you already have in your studio. Like I, I would say that if you have a good interface with good converters to begin with, then like purchase number two probably isn't the highest end A to D converters in the world. If you don't have things like decent mics, room treatment, decent speakers, all the other things that are probably a bigger return on investment. But then you look at a fully equipped studio like Brian's and he has all the things that he needs. He has great monitoring. He has good room treatment. He has all the toys he could ever want. And then those somewhat smaller differences of going from one, a good converter to an even higher end converter, maybe make more sense in that context. So I think yeah. That's True. something you have to weigh in as well is what are your weakest links and look to upgrade your weakest links first. And if you already have a, a good convert, the other big thing is when you're buying an interface, buy one you like the sound of, maybe it's the antelope audio stuff, you know, try some, hear some audio through them. And um, because your antelope audio, although you're on a HD system, do you have actual Pro Tools HD hardware? You must for the acceleration, but basically you're using antelope audio stuff as kind of your interface. Um, yeah, that's it, yeah. Like I, yeah, I'm using uh, uh, 192 ins and outs to right. go and do right. everything that I need to do in the studio. So all of that goes through the Antelope Audio. But yeah, for the processing, I have three HDX cards mm -hmm. plus, of course, the the computer. With, yep, uh, plus the computer plus yeah. the Antelope effects. So there's yeah, plenty of right. power so in there. There's a lot of processing. Must be a pretty diesel computer you got there too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Robert says, hello, Brian. Why do you use a summer mixing and why that Chandler specifically? Thanks for your time. Ah, yes. Good question. I have a good answer. Uh, years ago, uh, Buck Snow and I, who's another great engineer, went through a, a, a probably about 18 or 19 different analog summing boxes. And we had them all in the same room and we tested like real over uh, several days tested and and uh in a proper way proper level and we did blind tests with each other so we didn't know which one it was going through when we were going like a b a b and um so the the chandler limited came up on top that was one of the top ones and so we just kind of made a list of the top three top five top ten and then ones that didn't quite sound as good some of the things we were listening for is is the, the the clarity of the high end is the high are the high frequencies getting smeared or not is the low end still round is it getting flabby is it is it like indistinct so there's a lot of different things along the whole spectrum of frequencies that we were listening for and the the Chandler limited uh came up on top there are a lot of uh, good ones for sure um and and I do have to say that the analog summing is not perfect for every style of music that I mix if I'm doing some more like hip hop or EDM tracks, sometimes I won't I won't use those mm -hmm. because it, it it it's going through that analog process, and I feel like sometimes it loses a little bit of that that extreme punch that's in EDM. So right. I stay in the box. So it's not always used, you know, even though it's here in the studio. Uh, it's you know song by song, depending on the genre, I choose to use it or not. Makes sense to me. We had a couple of questions uh, coming in here about uh, revisions. Victor Sanchez asks, how do you schedule mix revisions with the artists and what time frame do you work on every song? And then Luke Tellier asks a similar question. How many revisions do you normally uh, get you know, or have to do? Okay. Uh, this song that we just heard by, by Carrie only had one mix revision. I would say that it's kind of rare. It's usually... Uh, I don't know, it could be three, four, five. Uh, it, it depends because they're not in the room with me. So it's understandable that I probably won't get it on the first mix, but you know, that's totally fine. I'm usually, I'd say a minimum of 16 hours on a mix, unless it has an extreme amount of, of instruments and tracks, like if it's orchestral or something, or, or just hundreds of tracks, then it takes longer. But uh, for scheduling, that I'm, I, I just go in between. I like, I'll do some mix changes for an artist and I'll send that off. And then I'll just immediately just go to the next song that either I'm starting fresh or to another set of changes. So I, I and then I just wait to hear feedback from, from the artist. And then I either get the approval or I have to do a few more tweaks. And I'll just, so I'll just constantly be moving. And I don't wait for that artist to get, you know, to, I just keep moving. 
on because mm -hmm. there's too much to do. Uh, does that fully yeah. explain it? I think that makes sense. If you need uh, additional clarification, just let us know in the comments there uh, as well. Uh, Sebastian Garcia Ferro, who is often here on our live streams, uh, was asking about the summing system as well, which you described pretty well. He was curious about that monitor system, though. Uh, how many different elements are going to that monitor system and what makes it uh, special or the one that you chose? Oh, uh, with the with the dad mom? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that is with the dad man software, which is attached to just for speakers. It goes to the Pro Tools uh, Matrix Studio. The reason I have that is I'm about to expand into immersive audio mixing. So uh, Dolby Atmos and Sony 360 reality audio. So I have that for that purpose, but I use it for the stereo uh, as well. Uh, I, I've always been a fan of switching between easily between either speakers or sources, the sources being, you know, the rough mix or, or my current mix or another reference that I've already mixed by the same artist. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to have those on buttons so I can easily go, okay, that, that mix was already approved last week. And now this is my new mix from the same artist to make sure that I'm close because I want it to be as close as possible to make it easier on the mastering engineer and everyone else, you know, I don't, I don't want to have it so extremely different, make the mastering engineer's job harder. So uh, I do that all the time. So that's really why I chose the, the dad mom is because of the immersive audio capabilities mm -hmm. and the switches to easily go back and forth. That makes it programmable. Yeah. All right. Uh, now we've come up on a half an hour here. Um, we do have uh, someone here who is saying that you are the shadow of life says Brian is very responsive on Instagram. So if you have any questions, oh, you get yes. to live <laughs> Q and A, go over to Vibbert's mixing on Instagram and ask for some follow-ups there. Uh, since uh, Brian's time is precious, I'm just going to ask him two more of the best questions uh, from in here. So um, let's see here. Rafael Nunez asks, what is the best method for getting a very punchy bass and or kick drum like I hear in professional albums? And by punchy, I mean you can feel it in your chest. So thoughts on uh, mixing kick drums, which is what you yeah. started off with on this mix. Yeah, that's right. And, and that, that punch that you feel in your chest, yeah, I like to feel that too. And, and uh, someone who really wanted to feel that was Michael Jackson in the studio. Mm. It was just like, it was like someone was beating you on the chest. It was so loud. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's, that's in that, that 80 hertz area, I, I feel. And then reducing that, that mid range in like the 200, 400, just to make sure it doesn't get uh, you know, too much of that really concentrated on that punch. But usually, I mean, if it's electronic, sometimes it's in the sample, that punch. And you want to make sure that you don't destroy what you're given with, yeah. with what, what you're doing. So that there's always that too. If it, always, if it starts with a great sound, then I'm not doing much to it. So I would say with, with both compression and, and EQ to get to get that punch and in between the kick and the bass, you really have to be careful that one is not messing with the other. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're, if you're, let's just say the kick, you're doing like 80 Hertz, then maybe the bass you want to go a little bit lower than that right. in the 50 and 60 range. And then maybe a little bit above that in the 900, but don't boost the same 80 frequency in, in the bass uh, guitar or synth bass as well, or else they're just going to be fighting each other. Right, make it's room not just for about what you're boosting, yeah. but what you're keeping out of the way of. Uh, That's that right. Um, one more question for me before we get to the final one here, and qu a quick question for me was: We saw you go through your mix pretty much in the order you might expect it to be laid out in a console or a DAW, where you heard kick, and then we heard bass, and then we heard guitar, and then we heard, yes. and so on and so on, down to the vocal. Is that the order in which you actually mix things and bring elements in? Do you start bringing certain elements in, like starting with just drums or starting with just vocals, or do you bring everything in at once? What's your um, like order of operations for the mix? Yeah, I've heard many different answers to this from from many people that I've learned from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like uh, Kevin Killen and, and Mick Gazowski who do have a little bit of an op opposite approach, but I, I completely understand why and how they do it. I, that is the order that I'm mixing. I want to get the, the, the rhythm section and the groove happening and, and then build it from there. And then once all the band is there instrumentally, then I add the vocal. Of course, you know, I've already listened to the vocal the very first thing, and I've made notes of, ideas creatively that I want to do with the vocal, either with a delay or reverb or, 
or whatever. Um, so I, I had kind of had that those fresh thoughts creatively written down. Uh, and I think that's the reason why some of the other engineers have the vocal in right away is because it, I mean, yes, the vocal is the most important part of the mix. But the way I build the mix is is exactly kind of how I went through it with the rhythm section first, and then adding all the elements and then and then the vocal. But uh, one thing I have to say is I add all of those in as a static mix no no rides mm -hmm. until the vocal is in oh. and then once the vocal is in then i go back and i do those fader rides because i'm doing everything around the vocal and enhancing the vocal and not getting in the way of the vocal so that that's a very important point to understand mm -hmm. Now, I told you that uh, that was going to be the last question before I find a one, but I'm so sorry. Agnabesh Carr Roy came in with a question that probably a lot of people want to know the answer to. And That's he okay. asks, uh, Ag Agnabesh asks, how to make drums tight? I'm having this problem. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, it, I guess it depends on whether they're analog or, or digital drums, if they're drum samples or if they're... I guess it's going to be more drum. often a problem people have with analog drums. Um, if it's my, real, my guess. a real drum set. Yeah, yeah because so, so often with digital drums, it comes down to sample selection is the biggest part of it, but then... Yeah, so so let's talk about real drums, a real drum recording. Um, I'm not a huge fan of gating, especially recording. I'm, I'm not doing any gating during recording, mm -hmm. but later on I may, especially the toms, if the if there's like a whole bunch of time, two minutes or something where the drummer does not hit a tom, I'll just mute that. Sure. Um, if it's not, I'll just say if it's not recorded well. If it's mm -hmm. adding to the drum sound, then it's like almost like overheads. It's just like right. adding to the ambience of the drums. Sometimes the tom mics are great. So, uh, but in general, most of the time I'm, I'm muting those. So I'm kind of get, cleaning it up. I'm cleaning up things that that microphone, extra microphones that don't need to be there because there may be 12 mics, there may be 20 mics of just drums. So I make sure that it's, you know, clean and, and a lot of things aren't, aren't fighting each other, especially with phase, making sure that the phase, uh, if there's two or three kick drum mics or especially, you know, top and bottom snare, flipping one out of phase, the overheads being in phase with the kick and snare those may be things that all of a sudden it doesn't sound punchy because the frequencies are actually fighting each other. So given that that's all fixed, then I, that's when I start getting into uh, adding like a layer of compression that is, is really just like on the snare, making it uh, punchy, a layer of the snare with compression that is highly compressed and doesn't really sound that good on its own. Mm -hmm. But when you blend it in, it, it's adding the punch. And same with toms. Uh, sometimes I do that with toms as well. If it's not uh, recorded as, as as well as I would like it to be, I would do the same thing with toms, where I I have an extra layer of toms. It's just like a duplicate of the track, and then I'm just really all I'm trying to do is get the the attack and punch out of that. And some of that may be like around 180 hertz, getting that little bit low punch. But some of it, of course, is around 5k, mm -hmm. getting that attack. And I just sure. blend that in to to enhance the other microphones. So all of them are in there. They're just like an added like uh, punch, you know, highly compressed track. Mm -hmm. That makes a, a, a lot of sense. Now, um, last question here. This was the final one I was promising, and then we'll, we'll let you go and get back to your busy day. But Yannick Stipple asks, what did you learn during your time with Michael Jackson? Highly appreciate your time. And I'd love to piggyback on that one if I can. You have worked with a tremendous number of really big artists, but also big producers and engineers. And I know that um, Michael is surprisingly interested in the production side, uh, you know, for an artist and a singer. So you've also worked with, I think, Phil Ramone, Jack Douglas, Daniel Lenoir. I think maybe you worked alongside Mick Kozowski at a certain point. Yes. Um, in addition to Michael, if there's any names of producers or engineers who you thought you learned a valuable lesson from, can you give us as close as you can to a one-liner for insights that you've gotten from some of the, the most powerful influences that you've had the pleasure of working with personally. So, so besides Michael, other producers you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, Michael. And then maybe if you have a similar ideas about any particular producers or engineers who you've, uh, who've influenced you personally. Yeah. Well, I mean, the main people that I, 
always say that I've learned from uh, were uh, Bruce Swedeen, Al Schmidt, definitely Mick Gazowski. Uh, even though I wasn't his main person at his studio, he would be at Sony Studios and I would be you know, with him in the studio. So those are like the main people that I learned from, uh, you know, Bruce, I just consider Bruce like the master. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment, uh, a good story. And then Al Schmidt, his miking, he's getting the sound. He was getting the sound from the, the microphone. So when it came to the mix, he didn't have to do much in the mix right. because he got it all from the mics and just learning mm -hmm. those techniques is amazing. Um, but like a producer like Phil Ramone, uh, sometimes I, I would just watch how he did things, how he ran the session. And he would, he would let the, he, he, sometimes you would be like, it seems, it seems like he's not doing anything, but really he's just staying out of the way and letting the artist, you, you know, create their music and, and do what they do without getting in the way. And then if he saw, ah, this isn't really going in the right direction, then he would step in and kind of pull it back and, and kind of get in another direction. I would say the same thing with Paul Simon as a, as a producer did the same kind of thing. So yeah, sometimes knowing when to let the artist do their thing creatively is, is important to know, but yeah, uh, Bruce, there was a, a during a, Mick, uh, during a Michael Jackson session, I forget the song, but it was during history, that album. And he had put up a, a song to mix and, you know, by the end of the day, it was sounding incredible and it, it wasn't done yet. He was just, going to continue the next day. And so then I had to write down some of the notes and all that of what he had done um, for a recall. Mm -hmm. And I noticed I was like, wow, this sounds like a done mix. It's ready for the radio. And then when I was looking through after he left, I noticed there was no reverb, no delays. There was just there were no effects whatsoever. Wow. And it sounded like completely done. I was just mm -hmm. like, how did he do that? You know, how, but it was all in for, first of all, he recorded it. So it was in, it was built into the recording. Yeah. And then, uh, as, as well, he was just his leveling of his starting levels. They were mm -hmm. just in, in his stereo imaging. It was just beautiful. So I learned a lot from that and, and just seeing how Bruce did that, that really influenced a lot of how I use the stereo field. Yeah. But uh, in terms of Michael, yeah, Michael was always in, involved with with the production. He loved the sound. He he didn't get um, very involved with decisions about the sound. He kind of would say what he wanted, mm -hmm. which was important, and then he would you know let us try to get those sounds that he was looking for. So he would leave the you know that part of it up up to you know Bruce Sudin or any other engineers in the session we had multiple rooms going for history so uh but he always wanted to push everyone to be their best which was uh an incredible uh, you know part about michael that that really made his albums be so amazing you know he really wanted things that were never heard before and like really pushing the envelope even even with the videos you can see that you know Good stuff. Well, I think that's about all the time we have for today. We've gotten, we've milked this man dry. We got two hours Excellent. out of the master class. We're really coming nice. up on 45 minutes in the Q&A. I really appreciate your generous time. If uh, you want even more generosity from one Mr. Brian Vibberts, go check him out over on Instagram, over at Vibberts Mixing. You can check out his site, I think, which is also maybe VibbertsMixing.com is the website as well. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So check him out. Uh, definitely check out the masterclass again because it's going to be there uh, on replay uh, available in, very shortly. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. Big thanks to Kerry Flaherty for allowing us to take a deep dive into this track. Uh, thanks to Antelope Audio for making this one free to the public. Uh, Brian loves their stuff. I'm talking to one of their mics right now. They make wonderful software and hardware interfaces and modeling mics as well. Um, big thanks also to you guys for being here. If you want to win some stuff totally yes. for free, we've got the MixCon mega giveaway going where you can enter to win for three chances to win thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of free gear from all the MixCon sponsors. Check that out at sonicsgroup.com slash MixCon giveaway. That's sonicsgroup.com slash MixCon giveaway. How good was that? I should be selling soap in like late night. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. Time. You're natural. <laughs> that was marvelous. <laughs> thank you for your, your, uh, your, your, your kind words there. Um, Brian, thank you again for being here. Thank you thank all you so much for, for, for such great questions. And thank you, Justin, Mixcon, Sonic Scoop, of course, Antelope Audio, and Carrie. We'll talk again. Looking forward to that. All right. Thank you, guys. See you next time. 
Okay, our stream is ended. You did great, man. Excellent.